Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truth to change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. It's good to have you all back. I see you've had your coffee, and uh, for those of you out on television, I trust you know by now that we take a break every half hour, and uh, we keep it informal, so that's why you can see coffee cups on the table. And uh, we're just here to study the Word, and I trust, I hope I'm not saying something out of place, but I trust that everybody has their own Bible, and that's what I always, if I can brag on anything, that's what I like to brag on, that I can get people to study their own Bible. And so when you all come in with your separate Bible, you don't know how I appreciate that. And the same for those of you out in television. Get your Bible and don't just listen, study. And uh, that's why we like to put it on the screen. In fact, I think I shared it with a whole national audience one time. I had a fellow call from Florida, and he had caught my program for the first time, and at the end of 30 minutes, he was saved, and he said, I'll never go back to my old uh, church or whatever. But he said, don't get the big head. Well, no, I'm not prone in that direction, but why? He said, you didn't do it. I said, well, I know that, but what did? He said, it was the scripture that you showed on the screen. That's why I just told Mike a little while ago, I'd rather have scripture on the screen as me. And he said, that was the first time in my life I had ever read a word from the Bible. And what verse it was, I don't know, but it did it in 30 minutes. And so that's why it's more important to see for yourself what the book says is to hear me say it. All right, so we're going to go right on back where we left off in the last 30 minutes, and that was in Acts chapter 6, and we're dealing with this multitude of Jews in the area now, Jerusalem, who are evidently part and parcel of all these who had come to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost and... Uh, when they saw that they had the free lunch and the hope of this coming kingdom, why go back home and grub out a living? So that's the way I look at it. They just stay in Jerusalem, and uh, they are. They're getting a free lunch, because now we're going to see how this all, if you study the Scripture, it's there. All right, let's just start at verse 1, even though we covered it. And in those days, that is, while Peter and the eleven are holding forth in Jerusalem, they're gathering all this wealth that people are turning in, and they're administering it out as people have need, but it's getting more than they can handle. It's just going beyond them, see? All right, here we go. In the those days, when the number of the disciples had multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians, and we explained that in the last half hour, Jews who had grown up outside of the land of Israel, and they were murmuring against the Hebrews, the homeland people, because their widows were being neglected in the daily ministration, the handout, see? Then the twelve, Peter, James, John, and the rest of them, then the twelve called the multitude of the believers, the disciples, unto them, and said, it's not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve what? Tables. I remember the last program I made mention of my old battalion mess hall. That thing was humongous. What was it filled with? Tables that would seat thousands at a time. That's what they have here. They had tables for who knows how many people. So I don't know where they're meeting, but nevertheless, you've got to put two and two together. They're coming together for their meals, and they're being served. But the twelve said, we've got more important things to do than to handle all of this. Now what the word is at the end of verse 3, what is it? Business. Well, it was big business. My, when you're going to dispense food, clothing and needs of thousands of people that's a big business in any man's language and so that's what we've got here that's what i want you to see all right then verse four but peter says we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word because after all what's the end hope christ will return and bring in the kingdom and that's why these people are so willing to not go back home now, I'm interjecting that. I can't prove that. I'm telling you that that's the way I look at it. 
that they just don't see any need to go clear back to Babylon or over to Spain or wherever because the king is coming, the kingdom will be coming in, and who needs houses and lands and wealth, see? That's the idea. Okay, so verse 5. So the saying pleased the whole, and again, what's the word? Multitude. And they chose Stephen. Now, I'm stopping right there because that's the next person we're going to study for a little bit. Stephen now is not of the twelve, but he is of the seven men who were set apart to take care of these material things, such as keeping the groceries out, keeping these people supplied, and maintaining a semblance of order and good business. See? All right, so they picked the seven, now verse 6, and when they set them before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, the word of God increased. See, it's still coming. And the number of the disciples, now that's not associated with, like we use the 12 disciples. This is just another word for the believers. And so these believers multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of what people? The priests, see? A great number of even the priests were obedient to not the law, but to the what? To the faith. And what were they placing their faith in? Who Jesus was. They are now recognizing that, yes, indeed, he was that promised Messiah. And if Israel will just recognize it, in will come that promised kingdom. Now, I'm going to make reference to it, and I'm going to use, like I said in the first program, I'm going to use a quote from a well-known scholar in years gone by, but I'm not ready for it yet in this half hour. We'll use it in the next one. How that these Jews are all coming in under what I call the kingdom economy. And that is, the law hasn't changed. Temple worship hasn't changed. They still practice all the food laws. They practice the Saturday Sabbath. They still go to the temple, and nothing has changed except now that the Messiah has come, gone back to glory, and they're expecting him to come back anytime, although they did know they'd have to go through some tribulation. But nevertheless, they're all looking forward to the coming now of the king and the kingdom. Okay, reading on. Verse 8, Stephen, one of these seven picked out specially by the Holy Spirit as he caused Luke to write, <clears throat> this Stephen was full of faith and what? Power. Where did he get his power? Holy Spirit. See? The power from on high. All right, now then we see all the way through the text that this man Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Everything that referred to him was he was working and operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, for example, come down to verse 10. Some of his opposition. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the Spirit, a reference to the Holy Spirit, by which he spoke. See, he's a man full of the Holy Spirit. All right, verse 11. Then they, his opposition, those that were still just frantically trying to stop this movement of accepting Jesus as their Messiah, they suborned or they drafted or they conscripted men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Well, <laughs> you know, it's just like I'm accused in my teaching when I point up Paul's epistles, then you are telling us that Jesus didn't mean anything? No, I didn't say that. I'm just saying that everything Jesus said was to Israel under the law, and everything he says to us comes through his designated apostle, and that's all Stephen had ever said about Moses. Well, listen, Moses' day has come and gone. Now we're ready to accept this Jesus of Nazareth as the primary individual, see? And then they thought that was downgrading Moses. Well, that's just the way people think. So anyway, that's their accusation. Verse 12, So they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, caught him, and brought him to the consul, and set up false witnesses. See, things haven't changed, have they? They set up false witnesses, and these witnesses said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, the temple, 
and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. <laughs> well, was that so bad? <laughs> because once Christ had returned and set up his kingdom, he's not going to use this same old temple that Herod uh, built. He's going to build his own millennial temple, see? And so Stephen was just being falsely accused and twisting his words. And, uh, well, I have it happen every once in a while, even in my own ministry. In fact, one of these fellows here just came a little bit ago, and this is typical right here. He said, Les, this verse says in this translation, just opposite of what you say. You don't mind. I won't point you out. And I said, no, it doesn't. I said, read it again. Well, before he left visiting with me, he saw it. Oh, he said, I read that wrong. But see, that's human. And uh, I have it happen every once in a while. Somebody called and said, Les, you said such and such. I said, no, I didn't. I didn't say anything like that. Yes, you did. Well, let's go see what the book says. Well, then they admit, oh, I heard you wrong. <laughs> see? But until they confront me with it, how many people have they told, well, don't listen to Les Faldick, he hasn't got it right. <laughs> well, it's not my fault. You know, they aren't reading it right. Well, anyway, same way with poor old Stephen. He's being falsely accused now of actually, he's telling it like it is that when this Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, will return and set up his kingdom, then all of this earthly stuff is going to disappear, and the whole millennial uh, environment will be totally different. Okay, so they bring him on the carpet. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now, we're not going to take this verse by verse. I would like to, but uh, I've already done it when we took the book of Acts verse by verse, but we're going to hit the highlights of it before we move on. Now they take Stephen up before all the big wheels of Israel. And the high priest said, Are these things so? Now then, Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, he actually up in, uh, where is it, verse 15 of chapter 6, his face was like that of an angel. So God was with him. And now Stephen speaks in verse 2. Now, you know, as I was rehearsing this again in the last week, getting ready for today, you know what just struck me? Never has before, but it did this time. How many times have you read articles and some of these newfangled uh, so-called books of so-and-so and books and so-and-so, and they come to the conclusion that our Old Testament really isn't that believable? Well, especially archaeologists. My, they'll come up and they'll just over and over say that much of what we have taken for granted in the Old Testament never happened. It's not true. But you know what? Stephen here, after the fact of hundreds and hundreds of years for a lot of it, is rehearsing everything in a compact way, beginning with Abraham all the way up to that present time, and fills in a lot of details that the Old Testament doesn't give us. And you know, I thought of it in that light. See, I don't care what these scholars say. Our Old Testament is believable. It's just as true as anything can be. And Stephen's address here confirms it. Now, like I say, I haven't got time to go verse by verse. So when you get home this evening, if you've got time, you just sit down and read this chapter 7, and you will see all of Old Testament history encapsulated and it's as true as anything can be all right but let's just start up there at verse 2 and he said men and brethren fathers see he's addressing <laughs> Jews no Gentiles hearken or listen to me the God of glory appeared visibly unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Now the question comes in just every so often, was Abraham a Jew? No, he couldn't have been a Jew because the Jewish race hadn't even started yet. The Jewish race was by covenant promise beginning with Abraham, but what was he genetically? He was a Syrian. See? His whole family was Syrian. Now let me show that. that. That'll give a good chance to answer a lot of questions out there in TV land as well. Come back with me to uh, Genesis. My goodness, I hope I can find it. Way back at the time of Jacob. Oh, 
thought it was in chapter 29, but I wasn't seeing it. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. Okay, chapter 28. 28. Because I want my whole TV audience to see this, and then maybe it'll save me a whole bunch of letter writing. <clears throat> chapter 28 of Genesis. Verse 1. Isaac. Abraham and Sarah's son. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise and go to Padan Aram, that's up there in Syria, where uh, Abraham and Lot and all them had stopped on their way down to Canaan. But go up to Padan Aram to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father. Now before we go any further, what was the relationship between Abraham and Sarah? Half-brothers and half-sister. So they're out of the same stock, okay? So go to Padan Aram, the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And uh, God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful, multiply thee, that thou must be a multitude. Now let's come all the way down to verse 5. So Isaac sent away Jacob. He went to Padan Aram, up there in Syria, unto Laban, the son of Bethuel, the what? Syrian. So the whole family was Syrian until God separated Abraham and gave him the covenant promises. And then, yes, from Abraham on, all those offspring are Jews, Israelites of the twelve tribes. But anyway, that answers that question, that we were dealing with Abraham the Syrian until God fulfilled his covenant promises. Okay, now we can come back to Acts chapter 7. And so the God of glory, verse 2, appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, and before he dwelt in Haran, he was a Syrian, and he said unto him, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred, and come into the land that I will show thee. So he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Haran, which was still up in Syria. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him unto this land, the land of Canaan, wherein you now dwell. Well, anyway, we're going to come on down until we get to verse 6. And as God is dealing now with Abraham, God spake in this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land. In other words, he didn't actually set roots down, but he just migrated up and down the length of what is present-day Israel amongst the Canaanites, see? And that they should bring them into bondage and treat them evil 400 years. Now, of course, that's a reference, I'm sorry, that's a reference to, uh, to nation. Egypt, I'm sorry. Now verse 7, And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage, Egypt, God says, I will judge, and we know he did. Now there again, the archaeologists in particular, if you ever read any of their articles, they maintain that there is no visible evidence of the Israelites ever being in Egypt. Almost no archaeological proof, according to their, their shards and so forth. But, you know what I always maintain? God has purposely hidden a lot of things in human history, like, for example, Noah's Ark. For what purpose? To force us to take it by faith. See, now, as soon as the archaeologists come up and say, well, of all the digging that they've done in Egypt and all of the Egyptian history, there's not one inkling of the Jews ever being in Egypt, well, if I'm going to believe that Israel was in Egypt, how am I going to have to take it? By faith. I don't care whether they can't find proof. Doesn't make a bit of difference to me. My Bible says they were there hundreds of years. And someday, maybe, the archaeologists, like David, there was another one. Do you know the archaeologists were just on a, they were on a binge. There was never a record of a guy by the name of David. So they just threw all kinds of doubt on the Word of God. Well, here, just in the last couple or three years, they found a stele, I thought that's the way it's pronounced, which was just sort of a, a dagger-like stone, and whose name do you suppose they found on it? David. And it just blew their minds. 
But that's the one and only time that, so far at least, that they've found something that I'm aware of that has an indication of David. But you see, I think God does that. Per Same with the ark. Why in the world does God keep that ark from human view? Because if it was out there where people, what would people do? They'd go and worship it. They'd make a shrine of it. And so the world still doesn't believe of a flood or in the fact that Noah ever existed. So again, how do we know it? By faith. And I think that's why God does it, to force us to take these things by faith in his word, see? All right, back to our text. I shouldn't get digressed, but it can't help it once in a while. Acts chapter 7, and uh, now verse 8. He gave him, Abraham, the covenant of circumcision. And after the covenant of circumcision, in comes the, the Jewish line now, not out of Ishmael or Esau, but out of Jacob and the 12 sons. And so circumcision then became the, the uh, covenant between God and Israel. All right, verse 9. The patriarchs moved with envy, the 11 brothers, and they sold Jacob or Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. It was all part of his divine purposes that Joseph should be sold into slavery, taken down into Egypt, because, now let's come a little further, verse 10. And delivered him out of all his afflictions, gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. In other words, Joseph is, again, a good illustration of how Jews many times come clear to the very top of Gentile governments. Joseph is the first one. Moses did. Daniel did. See? All right, so now then Stephen continues. Now, don't, don't forget the setting here. What is Stephen showing? to these religious leaders that all these prophecies that have been building up through the Old Testament are about to be fulfilled. And so he's showing them from Scripture, historically, that all of this was in God's divine purposes for his covenant people. All right, then you come on down to verse 11. Now there came a dearth, a famine over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, Great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance, no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first, that is, the other remaining sons of Jacob. All right, and the second time. Now you've heard me teach this, and we'll repeat it again. Why do you suppose the Holy Spirit inspired Stephen to make a point of the second time. Well, you see, you've got the same thing up here in uh, verse 23, 24, and 25 with Moses. Let's just jump up there a minute. I think I've got time. Yeah. Jump ahead. Verse 22. When Moses was learned or educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptian, was mighty in word and deed, and he was a full 40 years old, you don't get that in the Old Testament. This is a, a little tidbit that we get here. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, avenged him that was oppressed, and smote or killed the Egyptian. Now verse 25, for he, Moses, supposed or he thought that his brethren, the Jews, that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. What did he want to do? He wanted to lead the nation out with his own power and pomp and circumstance because he was a great man in Egypt. And so he thought that God had laid on his heart to lead the children out. But it wasn't God's time. And so what happened? Read on. They understood not. Verse 26, And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him or threw him aside, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Now what's all this a picture of? Christ's first coming. Both of them. When Joseph went down, I mean, when the brothers went down into Egypt to get grain and Joseph was in control, Joseph knew them 
Did they know Joseph? No. And they never did get it. All right, but when they came, like he says back there in verse 13, when they came the second time, now what happens? That great reunion between Joseph and his brethren. All right, what's the picture? The first time Jesus knew his covenant people, did they know him? No, for the most part. And they rejected him. But he's coming the second time. Now when he comes the second time, they're going to recognize him. They're going to see him, I think, coming in the clouds of glory. And every last Israelite or Jew, whatever you want to call them, <clears throat> that will be in that one-third remnant will become believers. All right, now it's the same way with Moses. The first time, he couldn't get the first base because they wouldn't trust him. They wouldn't believe who he was. Then come on down to verse 28 where we left off. These Jews who were rejecting Moses said, you're going to kill me as you did the Egyptian. And at that, Moses fled and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. And now here it comes. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Sinai an angel of the Lord in the flame of fire in a bush. You all know that back in Exodus chapter 3. And that precipitated then, verse 32, out of the bush, God says, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And the Lord said to him, put your shoes off from your feet. And then he comes on down to verse... 34, I have seen the affliction of my people who is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I am come down to deliver them. Now come, God is speaking, I will send you into Egypt. Now, for what purpose? <coughs> to be the deliverer. The second time, see? And so this is what you have to learn from Acts chapter 7, if nothing else, that it is brought home so clearly that at the first advent, Israel could not buy into it. They could not believe who he was. But when he comes the second time, they will recognize him, and as Zechariah says, they will say, What are these wounds in thy hands? And how will he answer? Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And so Israel will suddenly realize who he is and why he has come, and they will enter into the glory of of that kingdom. So always remember that, the first advent and the second. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.